We are so grateful for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Father, in these dark times, we're especially aware of our need for that lamp, for that light. So tonight we look to you and ask that you would illumine us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 4 very much picks up the idea continuing on from chapter 3. It's a warning to Judah, the southern kingdom of the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, the northern kingdom called Israel itself of the northern 10 tribes, it's already been conquered. Now the southern kingdom of the two tribes and the faithful ones from the 10 northern tribes who emigrated down as refugees to there, That kingdom remained, but it was under the threat of God's judgment because of their persistent sin and idolatry. Now, we saw in Jeremiah chapter 3 a wonderful invitation to repentance. And that's what continues on here into chapter 4, verse 1. If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Do you catch the flavor of that from verse 1? God's heart pleads to his people, return to me. Again, it carries on the same theme from Jeremiah chapter 3, where Yahweh pled with Israel to stop their backsliding and to return to him. The call went out to Israel, again, representing the tribes, especially there in the south. And then he makes a promise in verse 1. If you will put away your abominations out of my sight, get rid of your idolatry, because that's what abominations are all about. Get rid of them. That's what it means. You can't return to me and still hold on to your idols. But if you'll put away the idols and return to me, look at it there in verses 1 and 2, then you shall not be moved. In other words, if you want true security, get rid of your idols and trust the Lord. You shall not be moved. Now, Israel, or excuse me, let me just say Judah, if I want to be more technically correct. Judah did not obey this warning from God. So they were moved. They were conquered and exiled. But God was saying, if you would genuinely repent, let go of your idolatries and return to me, you shall not be moved. Then look at the second part of the promise in the beginning of verse 2. And he says, and you shall swear the Lord lives. So first, you won't be carried away into exile. You shall not be moved. But then secondly, you will swear the Lord lives. I don't know why, but lately across the internet, I've run across in recent weeks people who describe themselves as recovering Christians. Or they'll describe themselves as having had a Jesus phase in their life. But now they would tell you, no, all of that, it was just a phase. I'm recovering from all that. God seems dead or very distant to them. Look, I I don't want to give just a snap diagnosis, and I'm sure there's some individual aspects to each individual case. But I would tell you this, that if those people would truly return to the Lord, if they would let go of whatever idolatries that they put themselves after and truly return unto the Lord, then they would swear once again, the Lord lives. If God seems distant and unreal to you, friends, he hasn't moved. It's not he who has moved away from us. It's we who have moved away from him. And so the Lord pleads with us all over again, return to me. Come back to me. And then he says, this is how to do it. Look at it here, verse 2. In truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. This is the understanding of the Lord that belongs to those who return to him. If you return to the Lord, letting go of the idolatry and truly turning yourself to him, then you'll know something of him in truth. You'll know something of him in judgment and in righteousness, and you will be blessed in him. This is a wonderful invitation that God gave 
to his disobedient people. But look at it here in verse 3. He continues on. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now, if verses 1 and 2 sort of offered a carrot, so to speak, to the disobedient Judah and Jerusalem, you can see that the stick is contained in verses 3 and 4. Still, the heart is wide open. Break up your fallow ground. Come back to me. Do you see that phrase in verse 3? Break up your fallow ground. It's like the ground of your heart is hard. It can't be tilled. The plow needs to run through it once again. If God were to cast the seed of his word upon your heart, it would not penetrate. Break up your fallow ground. Prepare your heart to receive the word of God. But then he says also, if you saw it there in verse 3, and do not sow among the thorns. You see, what's interesting about fallow ground is it's not as if fallow ground bears nothing that grows, but it's just nothing good that grows in fallow ground. Weeds, thorns. And so that has to be cleared away. Clear away the weeds. Clear away the thorns. Prepare your heart to receive the word of God. And then he just sort of shifts images very quickly in verse 4 by saying, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Now I can imagine them seeing that first one and saying, circumcise myself. Well, I am circumcised. I'm a Jewish person. I'm part of the nation of Israel. Of course I'm circumcised. But then look at the next phrase. He says, no, the foreskins of your hearts. There's flesh over your heart that needs to be removed. You, you need to enter into the covenant community, not only by an outward sign, but truly in your heart. <clears throat> Why? Look at it. Here's the stick in verse 4. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one could quench it. Friends, I'm sure this was a difficult message for Jeremiah to deliver. We, we, we have no indication that Jeremiah would say such strong words with a great big smile upon his heart. There's something about preaching and warning people about the judgment of God that is sometimes so heavy for the preacher that many of us would just, honestly, we'd rather avoid it. It's not fun to be a preacher like Jeremiah. It's not fun to look at people and to warn them of the judgment to come. But friends, if there really is a God in heaven who judges sin, and if there really is a God in heaven who will not always overlook it when people reject him again and again and again, and who one day will call those people to account, is it not the solemn responsibility of the preacher to warn people of that? Now, it should always be done with the right heart. It should never be done in a cruel or in a gleeful way. If it were possible, it should be done in a somber, perhaps even in a tearful way. There is judgment to come. And as Jeremiah warned, he said, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one could quench it. It's as if this, from starting from Jeremiah 3 and continuing on to the first four verses of chapter 4, God gave them so many kind, warm words. He was wooing them. He was wooing them. But he had to say, but if you reject all of my wooing, there's judgment. And I have to warn you about it. Now, starting at verse 5, we have a real shift in the chapter. It's almost as if the first four verses of Jeremiah chapter 4 belong to chapter 3. Starting at verse 5, we're going to hear one of the most vivid descriptions of coming judgment upon Judah that you're going to find anywhere in the book of Jeremiah. So fasten your seatbelt and hold on for this. Verse 5. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say... Blow the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. 
Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. Do you catch the rhythm and the cadence there of Jeremiah's warning? It's as if he's speaking in the prophetic present. In other words, he is looking at the future judgment that will come upon Judah from an invading army from the north, which later on was fulfilled in the Babylonians. Uh, many years later from this, some 20 years later or more, excuse me. <coughs> so he was looking at this event in the future, but as the prophet of God, he announced it as if it were in the present sense, as if God gave him a vision of that judgment to come. And so what does he say? Look at it there in verse five, blow the trumpet in the land. Now listen, a trumpet or a shofar in Israel could be blown for many reasons. Sometimes it was a celebrative thing. Sometimes it was calling together for a feast or a festival or something like that. But you know what else it was? It was a warning. It was like the alarm bell. It was like the civil defense warning, the air raid siren screaming across the land of Judah. Run for your lives. The invader is on the way. Head for the fortified cities. They would do all that, but it would be of no help whatsoever. Why? Look at verse 7. Because the lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way. And this was prophetically fulfilled when Babylon conquered Judah. That's why he says in verse 8, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail. Do you know what Jeremiah sees? He sees the people of God then repenting when it was too late. Once the Babylonians are on the way to, to conquer Judah and there was no turning back, oh fine, then you're going to repent. Then you're going to put on the sackcloth and wail. When it's too late, and all of this warning was intended to draw Judah to repentance now in the moment. Look at it here in verse 9. This is how bad it was going to be. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes, the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Do you see how strong that is? Look at there in verse 9. The heart of the king shall perish. With the terrible judgment that is to come, even the nobility of Judah will not be able to stand. Even the high people and the people who should have their heads about them, their wits about them, they're going to have no answer. But not only the kings, look at it, the priests shall be astonished and the prophets shall wonder. Nobody will have any answer for the problem of the Babylonians sweeping down upon Judah. You're going to look to your leaders and you're going to say, oh, help us, please. Won't there come a leader who can rescue us from this mess? And your leaders won't have the answers. That's what he's saying to Judah. This will be your calamity in that day. Now, verse 10 is very interesting. It's as if Jeremiah was receiving this vision, but there at verse 10, he had to pause and say, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look at, he's going to have a little dialogue with God. Look at verse 10. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches the heart. First of all, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah was honest with God. It's as if in the midst of this prophetic vision that he sees and describes, he goes, Whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. What are you doing here? This isn't right. Did not you promise peace to this people? Look at the phrasing there in verse 10, where he says, Surely you have greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace. Now you might want to say, When did God say to the people, You shall have peace? If you look for that phrase elsewhere in the book of Jeremiah, if you go to Jeremiah, Chapter 23, verses 16 through 17. You don't have to turn there. I'm just telling you it's right there. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 16 and 17. Those are the words in the mouth of the false prophets. 
telling the people of Jerusalem and Judah, hey, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of you. You see, when this shadow of judgment loomed over the people of God, there were false prophets saying, hey, man, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Be happy. Everything's going to turn out all right. You don't have to worry about it. God's cool with it all. And we find out that these words, you shall have peace, those were not the words of the Lord to the people. Those were words in the mouths of false prophets to the people. And God disowned those words. God says, I wasn't saying that. Instead, look at that. There were voices saying that pretending to be from the Lord, while all the while, verse 10, while the sword reaches to the heart. The death blow comes from the sword that's falling upon them. So look at the sobering announcement of the coming judgment here at verse 11. At that time it will be said, to this people into Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I will also speak judgment against them. God says, no, no, no. Those people who said peace will come, forget it. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to wave little paper and say peace in our time. Instead, war is going to come. And as it did for Judah, it came like the hot Sirocco winds that come from the Middle East down upon Israel. And it's a wind that's too hot to cool you off like a nice cooling breeze might do. But it's also a wind that's too strong to thresh grain with. You know how they would separate the wheat from the chaff by throwing it up and letting the breeze? Well, it's too strong. It would blow away the wheat and the chaff. And God says, it's this kind of destructive rain, uh, wind that's going to be like the judgment that I bring upon you. And so here's the vision, verse 13. Behold, he shall come up like clouds and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. The instruments of the announced judgment were going to come quickly. They would come as quickly as clouds flow through the sky. Have you ever seen that? On a breezy day, how quickly clouds move across the sky. It's sort of mind-blowing, isn't it? As quick as that, that's how quick the judgment is going to come. Friends, we notice this in the character of God. That God often announces judgment far before it ever comes. Far before. Sometimes so far before that people just, they get lulled into well, I thought the judgment was going to come. Do you realize that this invasion from the Babylonians did not come for something like a generation after this utterance of, of Jeremiah? You can see, well, five years and it hasn't come, 10 years and 15 years and it hasn't come. No, God holds off the judgment for as long as he possibly can, hoping for, waiting for repentance. But then so often how it happens when the judgment comes, it falls so suddenly that people can hardly believe it. Do you remember when the communist countries of Europe fell in the late 80s and early 90s? What a remarkable thing that was. Nobody thought that the world could change that fast. And instead, it seemed like every day you open up the newspaper, oh, a new communist government has fallen. Now, you know, there's a, there's a different regime there. And it's the same way when God sets forth his judgment. Things that people thought would never happen can happen so quickly, so suddenly. So now, beginning at verse 14, here comes an appeal to Jerusalem. Look at it with me. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims from Mount Ephraim, make mention to the nations, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. Now, don't you think it's interesting that in verse 14, 
God gives an appeal to Jerusalem. After announcing this terrible judgment, then he says, please, Jerusalem, wash your hearts from wickedness. It seems that Judah had made a show of repentance, but had not offered true repentance before the Lord. And this whole idea that God issues forth a warning of judgment and then gives an invitation to repentance, it's so common for the Lord. Isn't it strange? How often it's ignored by us. It's as if, it's as if we don't believe God when he warns of the judgment. But his warning is ignored and his invitation to repentance is often refused and if there is a repentance offer, it's superficial. It's merely on the surface. It's merely on the show. It's only on a human level, but it never reaches down to the depths of the heart. And that's why God asked in verse 14, look at it there in verse 14. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? The wickedness in the heart of the people of Judah brought the threat of God's judgment. But it wasn't just a heart problem. It was also a problem with evil thoughts. And they indulged their evil thoughts and allowed those evil thoughts to lodge within them. Now, many times uh, I'll speak with people who wonder, what's the difference between sin and temptation? Listen, you can have a thought pass through your mind. But when you allow a thought to lodge in your mind, that's sin. That's a sin of the mind. So if it's passing through, that's one thing. But if you let it lodge, you say, now, you know, open for vacancy and all that. Come right in, lodge for the night, lodge for however, stay as long as you want. Then you are signaling to that evil thought come and occupy in my mind. But Charles Spurgeon preached a wonderful sermon on this text. It was titled, Bad Lodgers and How to Treat Them. He, he explained how evil thoughts are like bad renters or bad lodgers in a property. It, here's quoting Spurgeon. Now the Lord says, How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For they are all vain, these delays, these false promises, these self-deceptions. How long shall it be that they shall throng the avenues of your soul and curse your spirit? How long are you going to allow these evil thoughts to lodge within your mind? And really, i got to say it was a brilliant sermon. Spurgeon went on to explain several ways that evil thoughts are like bad renters. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an experience with a bad renter, but that's bad news. And, and Spurgeon explained, this is how an evil thought is like a bad renter. He says, first of all, a vain thoughts are bad lodgers because they're deceitful. They pay no rent. In other words, they bring nothing good in return. Um, they waste your goods and destroy your property. I see landlords nodding their head right now. They damage your house but they damage you. And then finally, they're bad because they bring you under condemnation. And then Spurgeon suggested, well, what do you do with these bad lodgers in your mind? I love it. He said, evict them. Serve them an eviction notice in the name of Jesus Christ. And then if they refuse to leave, Spurgeon said, starve them out. Give them nothing to feed upon in your mind. And then once you starve them out, once you give them no input, no entertainment or, or food in your mind, they'll leave soon enough. And then, if all that doesn't work, then make sure you've done this. Sell the house out from under them and put your mind under new ownership. I know, what a brilliant way to explain that. But you know, isn't it true that evil thoughts are like bad renters in our mind and they need to be evicted at once? Instead, look at what he says here in verse 16. He says, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country. He's talking about besiegers, invaders. And then verse 13, that your ways and doing have procured these things for you. 
You see, before the judgment came, God gave Judah and Jerusalem clear warning that the judgment would be your fault for allowing it. Ladies and gentlemen, I envision in my mind Somebody there, when the Babylonian army was sweeping down in all of its cruelty, when the judgments that Jeremiah announced were coming in reality, somebody calling out to Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, and saying, Why? Why? And God answering, notice that line there, from verse 18, Your ways and your doing have procured these things for you. In other words, it's God's way of saying, Don't you blame me. I gave you a way out. I shined my light and you rejected it. Don't blame me. This is your ways and your doing. And then in verse 19, friends, this is where, this is where deeply moves us. He begins to speak about the anguish of heart on the part of those who face judgment. So imagine somebody, here they are, the judgment is coming upon them. Maybe they've seen their children sold off into slavery, a wife abused and, and, and even killed before their eyes. Everything, their property destroyed. And there they are. This is how they feel. Verse 19. Oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Do you catch the emotion of that in verse 19? Oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. Jeremiah prophetically speaks in the voice of the one who is plundered by these invading armies to come. And it's not only an army of material destruction with the loss of land and tents and curtains, but it's a true affliction of the soul. I don't know how many of you have an old King James Version in front of you. I'm reading from the new King James. The old King James says something like this. My bowels, my bowels. Because it's referring to the guts. And in the Hebrew mind, the guts, if you kind of want to say the lower GI tract, that was where you really felt the emotions. And friends, I don't know if you've ever had food poisoning where you're cramping and vomiting and it's just, it's miserable. It feels awful. And you're not sure you're going to die, but you almost wish you might because it feels that bad. That's the kind of emotion he's describing. Matter of fact, the word pained in verse 19, one commentator says that it's a word for intestinal discomfort. Literally, Jeremiah was sick to his stomach about what was going to happen to Judah. And so he says, verse 21, How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? How long will this war go on? Verse 22, for my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I wonder how the people received that, what he said in verse 22. Look at verse 22 again. For my people are foolish. They have not known me. First of all, there's some grace there, isn't there? Do you see the grace in verse 22? He still says, my people. Oh, they're foolish. Oh, they're disobedient. Oh, I'm bringing judgment upon them. But nevertheless, they are still my people. But why are they so foolish? They're so foolish because they have not known me. Verse 22, they are silly children and they have no understanding. Now, I think it's very unlikely that the people of Judah saw themselves this way. They probably saw themselves very sophisticated. Oh my, we're very smart. We know what's being discussed 
in the capitals of Egypt and in the capitals of Babylon and in the capitals of Assyria. No, we're very refined. We're very sophisticated. Yes, look at us. We have a very refined knowledge. And God looks at them and says, you're like silly children. You have no knowledge. And then look at it at the end of verse 22. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Oh yeah, you've got a wisdom. You want to know what you're wise in? You're wise in the way of doing evil. Boy, it's amazing how clever you can get. You're an absolute Mensa member when it comes to doing evil. Your IQ is off the charts. You can devise ways and excuses and cover-ups and all the rest. You're very sophisticated about that. How wise are you about doing good? How far does that knowledge get you? And God, with just this laser beam of analysis, diagnoses their condition. And then verse 23. These are mind-blowing verses. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was that thou form and void. Wait, just pause right there. Does that remind anybody of anything? Okay, think about that. Let's, let's start again. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. You see, he's turning around the images of Genesis chapter 1. It's as if Jeremiah is saying this, the judgment that comes upon Judah is going to be so severe that when God in Genesis 1 took chaos and created it into order, God says, I'm going to take the order of your society and turn it into chaos. I'm going to uncreate things. Now, I freely acknowledge that modern man takes a look at the concept revealed there in those verses and says, are you kidding me? We live in a world of progress. We've got technology. Every new iPhone is way better than the last one. Every few years, chip technology takes off. Everything's getting better and better, and we are on a rocket ship of progress and can never go back. Don't you believe it. You rejoice in the order that there is in this world? Under the judgment of God, what is perceived to be order in this world can be uncreated at a snap. And we can go from order into chaos very quickly. What would happen? What would happen if instantly, for some unknown reason, the internet just went down. I mean, children would die of boredom, would they not? I mean, this would be the first, most immediate cause. But can you imagine how much in society is built upon actually such slender threads? Oh, no, friends, it could happen very quickly. And the illusion that we have of unstoppable progress is actually just that, an illusion. And it certainly could not stand against the judgment of God. Look at how he describes it here in verse 23. The heavens, they had no light. Verse 24, the mountains, and indeed they trembled. All the hills went back and forth. Verse 25, indeed there was no man. The cities were broken down. And why? Verse 26, at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. The light in the sky, the permanence of the hills, Everything around us, man, it's secure as anything. It can all be shaken up by the judgment of God. You see, the point for Jerusalem and Judah was plain. The God who could devastate the entire earth by his presence and by his fierce anger could easily bring judgment upon them through an invading army. They needed to remember the greatness of the God whom they have offended. But friends, when I read descriptions of the judgment of God like this, 
of sort of taking creation from order into chaos, almost reversing Genesis 1. I think of it in terms of what Jesus endured on the cross. Friends, don't you believe it was a devastating judgment which eventually did come upon Judah from the Babylonian army? You better believe it was. Absolutely devastating. Do you realize that whatever judgment has ever been exercised on a human level, Jesus bore more than that upon himself in the cross. All the judgment that humanity has ever collectively deserved was poured out upon the Son of God as he was on the cross bearing the sins of the world upon himself. You know, my first reaction to this is first, first I gasp for the sake of Judah that had to endure this judgment. Then I gasp for the sake of our own Western culture. That surely we deserve this judgment. I, I don't know if we're going to repent. I don't know if there's going to be revival. I don't know if God will forbear the judgment until that time. I don't know. But certainly we deserve it. And I gasp for that. But then most significantly, I gasp and think, what judgment was laid upon Jesus, the Son of God, upon the cross. And I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for bearing within yourself perfectly the judgment that we have deserved. Let's move on here. Verse 27. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken, I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up on the rocks, and every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. God is announcing how complete the conquering of Judah will be and how the Babylonians would come and exile the population and depopulate the cities. And that's exactly what they did. They only left behind a few of the poorest and weakest people, and everybody else was taken away to be slaves and workers in other parts of the Babylonian empire. But you know what? Can we agree this is a dark chapter? Should we not grasp for any beam of light that we can find in such a dark chapter? Then look at verse 27 and pay attention to the line, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Thank you, Lord. You will not make a full end. It's as if God says this, I'm going to judge my people, but they're still my people. And I will not make a full end of them. I will bring them back in the land. I will continue to work for them. My people will be my people, and I will continue to work through Israel. There are certain people who believe that in God's unfolding plan of the ages, that he has abandoned the people of Israel, that they no longer have any place in his his, uh, unfolding drama of the ages, that they're just another people, that God has no more plan for them than he does for the Irish people or the Icelandic people or the Inca people. There's the Israeli people. I mean, there's just no difference. But you know what God says in his word? He says very plainly in verse 27, yet I will not make a full end. Oh, I will bring judgment upon them, but I will not forsake them. And they will continue to have a place in my unfolding plan of the ages. Verse 30. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, The voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hand saying, Behold, for my soul is weary because of murderers. The chapter closes 
with God's heartfelt appeal. Did you see that in verse 30? What a frank question. When you are plundered, what will you do? It's as if Jeremiah says, come on, people, tell me. When this comes upon you, what are you going to do? It's as if Jeremiah says, I know what you're going to do. You're going to put on your jewelry and your decorations and paint your eyes up nice. You're going to come and welcome the invaders as a, and he's using the kind of picture here, as, as a woman of the streets might, you know, welcome a suitor on the streets. You know, hey, sailor, what's going on? You think you're going to seduce them. You think you're going you're gonna to make something good with these people. You think you're going to charm them. No way, he says. You're not going to be like a lady decked out for a fancy evening. You're going to be like a woman in the anguish of labor. Now that's kind of a contrast, isn't it? You think of a smart woman on the cover of a magazine, you know, nice dress and, you know, all made up, and there she is going out, you know, she's red carpet, gala, whatever. And contrast that with a woman screaming and crying out in the midst of pain and childbirth. Jeremiah says, you think it's going to be like the red carpet gala? No, it's going to be like the agony of childbirth. And you see how he ends it? He says, she spreads her hands saying, woe to me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. As he said earlier in verse 30, your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. You think you're going to charm the Babylonians when they come? You think they're going to say, wow, these Judeans, they really got it. We're going to let them slide. No way. You're not going to charm them. You're going to be under the judgment. Friends, we've got to admit, this ends on a very dark note. The contrast between the red carpet gala and the woman crying out in the pain of childbirth. But God has his beams of light. Within every warning of judgment is an invitation to repentance. And this is something for us to consider in each one of our personal walks with God. Do we live in constant repentance towards God? Because repentance isn't just something for unbelievers to consider. It's something for believers to consider. Jesus dictated how many letters to the churches of Revelation? Seven. Seven letters to the churches of Revelation. Do you know how many of those churches that he told to repent? Five. So I'm not saying that every Christian needs to pay attention to repentance. Just five out of every seven. Friends, keeping short accounts with God makes us ready for his judgment. So let's endeavor to do that. Let's plead to God right now. Lord, would you help me to keep short accounts with you? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting.